Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for coming. I'm Johnny Jetzer. I'm the curator of Art Basel Unlimited for the third consecutive time. And I'm really pleased to introduce, introduce four artists. It's, it's really a treat. Last year we got three artists, three unlimited artists in the Art Salon. This year we even have four. To my right we have Alex Prager, then we have Nick Maus, Gavin Canyon, and Sam Falls. Uh, thank you, thank you. I think I take your applause for, for Unlimited and for the wonderful sh uh, show that turned out. And I think the most important factor are the artistic works after all. Of course, there are many enablers. The galleries are very important and we also do work with the committee of galleries who vote in uh, the works and uh, we discussed for two full days actually about the selection and out of that selection I create a show which is always very interesting. This year one characteristic is that we have a fair amount of American artists almost kind of an American revival and we have as much vintage works like work from a certain age but also a lot of younger artists being part of Unlimited. I don't want to name like all the years of birth. Actually, when I worked in the United States, I, I was trained not to ask people their age at job interviews, and I think it's a very good invention. But roughly, all of them are born around 1980, plus minus. And it's pure coincidence that two of them are based in uh, California, in Los Angeles. This is Sam Falls and Alex Prager and Gavin and Nick are based in New York City. So we have this kind of uh, tra traditional pattern of East Coast, West Coast, but you will find out easily that it doesn't really make sense, I guess. Although I, I would say just uh, that the, the geographical location of the production of a work plays a role nowadays, and we're going to see that in the presentation of the artist. What is really a treat is to have the artists talk about their work, and so that's the, the main profile of this panel, actually to hear the, each single artist present their work uh, present here at Unlimited with slides, and giving more insights into the contextualization, the production, the ideas, and the reception of the work. And uh, in the last part, we're gonna discuss a little bit about also this title, Turning Space into Place. It's a, a terminology that I took from Martin Heidecker, who wrote a lot about what the space of art could be. And this is a text, it's called uh, Art and Space. It's one of the texts of, by Martin Heidecker that is totally non-political and where we don't have to have uh, any remorses or, or where we won't have any troubles to quote him. But I think this text is really great because it declares art as a kind of a fourth dimension as a collapsing of space and place, of the creation of an artistic identity of space and of a different level than, for example, everyday reality. And that's exactly what we try to do here at Unlimited, to enable visitors to be with art and to enter actually this fourth dimension that each artist is proposing. So, Sam, you will be the first to talk a little bit about your work. The work is titled Untitled Palette 9 Pomona. It's from 2013. And uh, I would ask to have the first slide, please. And then thank you very much, Sam. Hello. Um, I'll let the slide load. So this is the area where the work was produced, which is in Pomona, about an hour east of LA. And this work is descriptive of kind of a larger body of work that is why I moved to LA. Originally, I was working in New York and kind of dealing with issues in photography and how they can be translated into painting and sculpture. And um, one of the ways to do that was to not use the professional materials of photography and translate it more to vernacular materials as well as um, kind of more traditional painting materials and sculptural material being fabric and wood and things like that. And so the work is made here 
with these pallets, and it's about a 10,000 square foot parking lot in the desert, and it's surrounded by shipping companies. And so usually for these types of work, I find something within the area, like for example, when I first moved to LA, I used car tires that I collected from around Highland Park and then put on fabric and left out there, which to me was really something I was coming to terms with in LA with car culture and seeing tires everywhere. And the material, the subject matter always yields kind of an indexical image relating it to photography, such as the circular tire, as well as an abstract one. And you kind of also have a pure circular form on the material. So this project, when I got out there, I found I was surrounded by these shipping companies, specifically ones making recycled shipping pallets. And it was really great for me because it was A, an easy delivery, but B, the pallets are the standardized size that creates a grid structure. But also what I found after making individual works was that they're repaired by people. So you have this organized grid on the outside and on the inside. You have this very personal element um, as people repair them in these different haphazard ways. So. Again, um, the subject matter then dictates the substrate. So for this one, I used a poly cotton blend. The polyester kind of being in, in tone with the industrial area, and then the cotton dealing with the wood and the desert. And I chose orange because of the desert. And then it's left outside for um, almost a year, and the sun fades away, everything unprotected by the pallets. And then afterwards, it yields this sort of organic photogram, um, but you know, there's no photosensitive materials being used. And this one specifically ran the length of the parking lot, which was great to have the opportunity to show it here at Unlimited, because I don't know where else I would show it. Um, but as you can see also in the pictures, you know, they're each the exact same size, but each one has this totally different grid structure on the inside. And so you kind of have this descriptive element of an object, but also this more abstract representation created by other people. And another thing that interests me with all of this is the fact that the work is made with a subject matter that relates to the place it's made. I mean, it's very perfect for the subject here. Um, because for me, it relates to not only specifically this industrial area in Pomona, but also the sun that passes over California every day and the time it spends there. So unlike a landscape photograph that's transferred to a C print, this for me is the actual object that spent time out in the area. And it kind of brings all of that, that sun and time with it as it goes anywhere, like Zurich or, sorry, Basel. Thank you very much. So you, you work pretty much with, I mean, as you also state in your text, you work pretty much with situations that you find. And you start to put them together, analyzing them, and then uh, dividing them, maybe refining them. I thought it was also very interesting that you said that you picked the fabric actually to represent the, the industrial neighborhood of your studio. And on the other hand, like this this wooden material that you used as a as a form giver, and so you 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 pick this synthetic cotton fabric that maybe is not the easiest to bleach. So it took longer yeah. to bleach it out, and it was even more exposed. Yeah. I think it's also interesting that you the, the color that maybe you can say something about the color and why you picked that specific color. Well, yeah, I chose the orange because of the desert landscape where it's made. And there's kind of the Santa Monica Hills surrounding it. And it's really, you know, it's really orange. And especially as it bleaches out, that subdued orange color really matches the dirty landscape. And um, I also did singular ones with moving blankets that really fit the subject, um, of course, because of shipping. But they didn't, but they're actually more colorful in a way. And so the orange is a nice sort of relationship to the area. What is interesting with, uh, with the palette nine is that you, you break the dimensions of the canvas and you really go into three dimensional space. 
And it's a very beautiful example about like size, but also a, a, a sheer immateriality of the installation. So you have your using material, the, the sizes are impressive. I mean, it's 30, 30 meters long, 1,200 inches long, this piece of fabric. But nevertheless, it, it's very airy. And maybe tell us just a little bit more about this presentation form of, of the arc or of the curve. Because I think you had different ideas in the beginning, right? Yeah, I mean, it, and, the, and the work itself is open to different options of display as long as it's totally visible. And the arc was really interesting because it can occupy this volume while still being very light. And, um, and, and it kind of catches the light. And you can see inside of it. And to make something that's totally flat and then change it into the sculptural form also then translates what I was saying before about working with photography, but merging it with things like sculpture. You know, So to have something that showed up in this little tube and then is able to be unrolled and, and occupy that space. You, you don't think about the object itself only, but as has been the goal with like a lot of movements like minimalism, you then interact with the piece itself and the space it takes up and then the space you take up and you think about your self in relationship to it, which is also important with the subject matter that I always choose, like the tires or the pallets or like even two by fours or rocks. It's about using everyday objects that can yield something that is more abstract, but also that you have, everyone can recognize and have a relationship with. Thank you very much for your presentation. So I would like to hand it over to Gavin Kenyon. The title of his work is Pharaoh. The work is presented in the very first space of Unlimited, like in this black entrance hall. It's on the floor to the right, the floor piece. It's a, a brand new work, actually, 2014. And, and I think you unpacked it for the first time, actually, here in Basel. Yes. And uh, I think we also have some pictures. It would be great to hear more about your idea and how you developed this work for Basel. All right, well, it's a pleasure to be here. This, of course, is Pharaoh in front of Kara Walker, which I think is a very nice pairing. It's amazing the way that this whole show was put together and fit together with all of the different pieces. I, I want to thank Johnny for, for um, doing such a good job putting all of us together. So my work here, for those of you who don't know, I guess I'll give you a quick uh, rundown of how these things are produced. Because that's the first question that I'm often asked about this work. Each element, and there are 50 in this piece, are made by filling fabric bags with concrete, in this case, pigmented concrete. The bags are suspended uh, on a crane, filled with concrete, tied, and then laid on the ground, and then laid on, e on top of each other in a very systematic way, from one end to the next. And the hydraulic pressure acting against the membrane of the fabric is what produces the form. I, I like this technique because it takes a little bit of control away from me, and it produces something that uh, is difficult to get in another way. The, uh, a sense of pressure on a membrane that you see in each of the parts of the sculpture to sculpt directly is very difficult. Here's another view from the end. You can see that it was begun at the far end in this photograph and just piled along in one direction. Incidentally, I, I work in New York and this is a very large thing for me to produce. It, uh, it took up the entire length of my studio. I've often thought that those of you who live in LA have a, have a luxury of space, which is, which I'm sure you enjoy. It would be so hard to make your piece, for instance, in New York. And this, essentially is as large as I could make this in my space there. Uh, 
Here's a detail. Each of these pieces has a fur section at one end, the narrow end of, of each of them. They vary within a set of tolerances. So it's a very systematic way of producing these things. Each individual piece is different, but similar. The colors also vary from one to the next. Uh, just to give it like this interest of variation. Another detail, these ends of each of them are, are formed from tying off the fabric tube. And when, when we take that apart, when we take that off of the, of the sculpture, it tears some of the breaks, some of the concrete. So there are these rough patches, there are smooth patches, there is only really only the su suggestion of, of a full smooth surface because there are many air bubbles, air holes. But I like that roughness. I like the, it's like the resolution is at only a certain, a certain point that works to read it. And I like playing with that. I like playing with color. I also chose orange for this piece though very, very muted. Can you tell us a little bit more about like the, the intended connotations and the non-intended connotations? I mean, on one hand, I think also in the, in the catalog, there is this, uh, this notion of the body bag or of the wrap body in fabrics. And, and we, we know these images from news yeah. casts actually of, of catastrophes, of mass burials, of uh, yeah, improvisation, because they, they have to find a way to bury them as fast as possible, and of these dead bodies wrapped in fabrics. So is that something that you to consciously build in, or is it like something that you risk? Well, it's both conscious and it is a risk. Um, I'm interested in the form, certainly. It's an image that we do see this piece is not very political. It's much more formal in its interest in this form. Um, but that was a way to generate this thing. I personally don't, I don't think it matters what, what you think about, what an artist thinks about as they make a work. It has to stand alone in the end without the support of without the support of words, essentially, without the support of a text or, or an intention even. Because say 500 years from now, how many people when they look at whichever of our work actually survives that long will, will have the backstory or care about it? So you believe in a, in a formal invention, in, in a form of visual communication, and you, you are saying that the, the strongest imprint of art is always the visual impression that it leaves and its interpretation. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Through I mean, time, there's also the many fur things fall element. off of... There's also the fur element, yeah. actually, that you bring in that leads one more towards animals and, and away from, from this body bag interpretation. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you also have this title, Pharaoh, which is again leading towards the world of animals. Yeah. It, it has two main meaning, meanings. One, the classic meaning is a litter of pigs, but also more generally to bring forth. Um, and I, like, I liked it because of, the, because of the pile, the color, and also the fact that these things have this these pieces have, have a sort of semblance of the pressure that a, that a body does from the circulatory system. There's, there's a fullness to them and a tautness 
inherently to the, the skin, but it is removed from the living clearly. They're very hard. They're almost something. I think a, a beautiful reference for me is also the, a, an art historical reference is Klaus Oldenburg's soft sculpture. And actually they have the aspect or like the visual information of softness that gets contradicted as soon as you see the surface and the obvious uh, mixing of concrete into those forms. And you can tell that they are totally hardened. But, but that's, that's a very strong trait for me personally in that work is this, this whole dialogue between softness and being rigid and, and to being alive and to be static and to be an object or maybe also turning into a subject or like coming to life, but in, on a very intellectual mode. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's, I mean, I'm not sure what I can say to that. I think it's true. It, it, it is one of the, Thank you. one of the <laughs> more interesting things about that piece. Thank you very much, Kevin, Kevin Canyon. And I want to pass the microphone to Nick Maus. He's uh, one of the other artists who lives in New York. And the work that he presents here, Untitled 2014, is as well newly produced. Actually, it was kind of in a, in a prototype state. And so like the application, it was a description with a sketch and maybe also a certain risk, but I think that's part of the adventure or that makes Unlimited a real show that we also produce new work and that the artists, the galleries and uh, Art Unlimited, the committee take the risk actually to, to bet on, a, on an artist and to trust the artist to produce a fantastic artwork. Thank you, Nick, for accepting the invitation. <laughs> Sorry, I was just, uh, I had hoped to show the original sketch, um, but I'm missing it. So, um, as you said, Johnny, okay, it's, uh, this is the first time I'm showing the work. I, uh, conceived it especially for this situation. And uh, as I was thinking about it, I went back to an interest in things like uh, festival architecture, temporary architecture, architecture is meant solely for display, um, that frame perception and temporality. And um, I had also been thinking for a while about a sort of moving textile as a support, and uh, particularly the kind of evocative potential that you already have in something like a curtain, that it can be something that has its own presence, because I think it sort of almost anticipates you know, the fact that you or somebody else will be moving it at some point during the day, opening or closing it for a certain occasion. Um, from something like that, like a curtain in a domestic setting, it's sort of a short leap to a theater backdrop or the painted curtain that hangs at the front of the stage, which splits and parts to the side when a performance begins. So these kind of ideas about different kinds of spaces and also painted planes kind of cutting through a space were combined in a way in this piece. And, um, also was interested in trying to do something within this situation where there's you know this huge constellation of works that would potentially generate a work that could be both transparent to itself and also um, also to kind of delineate its own uh, specific zone. Uh, so that that zone, within that zone, there would also be something like a, a way in which the work has a constantly shifting relationship to the viewer as they experience the work. Um, I think it's something I, I, I've seen things like that in you know, Raul Ruiz films where you look out the window and the trees start moving and all the furniture moves because it's on wheels. Um, so there, this sort of kind of cinematic trickery that also came into play, I would say. Um, I'm also always looking for another way to work. Uh, there's a sort of level of unfamiliarity with the material that I'm working with and the kind of 
conditions that it imposes on me that I'm interested in. So there's this aspect of kind of going into a language that I'm not entirely familiar with. Um, and I, you know, that's, that's actually very important to me that it sort of makes, makes an imprint on the work, the sort of process of coming to understand the work as it's happening. Um, I guess uh, I'll scroll through the images. What you see is um, these two painted curtains, which is different from the original proposal, which had been a sort of very long serpentine uh, S curve track, which is automated uh, and placed within a kind of corridor. So it's open from both sides, and you can pass through it rather than a closed room. Um, that ended up changing, and I made two two tracks which are sort of drawn as different shapes and each has its own movement program so I devised a kind of choreography for the track of each curtain um, and at times it appears like there's a sort of you know dialogic relationship or dependency between these two entities in the space as they kind of move towards each other or oppose each other and um, the whole space is lit by these kind of built-in vitrines which are illuminated from above and they contain these fragments of drawings very much displayed on, on metal stands. Um, and I guess this sort of movement of the curtains, which is quite slow and I think says something about the kind of movement that happens in a situation like this, an affair, that it, that it slows down the pace a bit. I mean, if you are willing to go there with it. Um, and this, you know, what the curtains reveal or what they conceal is sort of the open question, I would say. You know, there's, there are these drawings and there's the light and shadow that's cast and that moves with the curtains. And then there's also viewers who get lost in the installation or who are just taking a moment in there. And for me, that's that's the picture sort of coming together. Just to understand, I mean, there's always, it, it obviously has a lot to do with painting. Mm -hmm. And uh, paintings are sold and mostly shown in domestic interiors. Mm -hmm. And at some point they hit a certain choice of the inhabitants regarding curtains and uh, <laughs> wallpapers and so on. Yeah. And what is really interesting is like this merging. It's something that we know, for example, from also from John Armleder with his furniture sculptures, where he actually pairs certain domestic situations with paintings, but he doesn't really merge them. And I think it's really interesting that you use the curtain as canvas, and it has totally different uh, qualities than than a, than a, a normal canvas. It's shine through. It's it's see through, and on the other hand, I, I see these vitrines, these display windows, almost as windows because they spend lights. So actually, the curtains are not in front of the of the window. They kind of emancipated themselves from the window and they turned into performer because they seem to almost to be like on a stage and and have like this dance movement in the middle of the stage. I also think that it's fantastic that actually the movement is not steady and it's not, um, you can't really anticipate what's going to happen next. So there is also this aspect almost of an invisible hand or of a, of a presence that, of an invisible presence taking care of that job. I think it's really well done that it's not just a mechanical opening and closing of the curtain, but it's much more a modulation of space. Because also the way it's placed, actually to see through through the stage makes makes a big difference. And you can see all this. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your interest also for for interior design and decoration, because it seems to be something that you you are investigating since a long time and you have also curated show shows that were related to a certain extent to that subject matter? Uh, <clears throat> I think my interest in, you know, objects that are categorized as decorative or sort of histories of decorative design has to do with finding another 
another vantage point from which to look at sort of aesthetic production. And, um, you know, a lot of times there is a, a total, there are certain people who would sort of transfer between a mode of high art and also work in, in a decorative mode. And, um, and those kinds of switches and transferences are really interesting to me because in a way, I think also the way in which I work, which moves between different media, is always also interested in showing that they're all existing on the same plane. So for me, and I think what you said before about you know, how the, the painting and the curtain have somehow merged um, has to really sort of hits the nail on the head in that the, the work can maybe no longer be ascribed to a category like painting or decoration, but it's sort of fallen into another category. And that's um, that, that moment of sort of being stuck in there is what I'm really interested in. And it seems also to apply to the vitrine, because mm -hmm. I mean, there are those, those uh, highly artistic objects on mm -hmm. display, but mm -hmm. actually the display window and the whole situation of, of this display window that is integrated in the wall and even the lighting that you, you, that you have chosen seems to be almost a quotation from certain times, from mm -hmm. certain modes of presentation. Mm -hmm. And so everything seems to be as genuine as the painted object. So mm -hmm. you have the painted object, but actually it's the whole light box and the, the whole wall is part of it actually and is as, as important as, mm -hmm. as the brush yeah. work or the yeah. brush strokes. Yeah, but I also like the sense that, you know, those niches feel slightly abandoned I mean, there's, there's something in there, but it's a bit like something is also missing. And that, that I would say, is another characteristic, in a way, of the way I'll construct a drawing or a room, is, is that there's always a hole somehow, or some, some kind of open space, which still has to be filled in, in a way. And um, for me, that's very important in kind of generating a work that's always on this threshold of still becoming the work. Uh, so that in this piece, for example, I'd, I'd like to sort of give the feeling that you're actually walking into something like a sketch or into a space where something has been cut out or removed. And it's, it becomes sort of uncertain what's, what's actually there and how they're relating to one another and specifically to yourself, looking at them. Thank you very much, Nick Maus. And the fourth artist with us today is Alex Prager. I think it's very interesting to see you work in the context of Unlimited, because mostly you encounter flows of visitors, like thousands of people present. Like, there's always a crowd around you. And it, it's almost a double layer when, when one enters your space. The installation is entitled Face in the Crown, Crowd. It's from 2013. And it's a, it's a video projection on three screens. And I had a feedback on your work. I told you previously, like uh, this lady approached me and told me, yeah, very well done, well curated. But Alex Prager, you should give her more space. It's just too tiny, that little projection box. And I mean, we can talk about that later, but just an introduction. Thanks for accepting uh, the invitation and uh, Thanks for having talking me. about your work. Very excited to be here. Um, <clears throat> so um, I was born in Los Angeles and raised there. And I'm very um, influenced by Hollywood and um, set design, creating a, a temporary world, as well as the kind of seedy underbelly that exists in LA that um, contrasts starkly with the beautiful landscape that, the, that we have there and the um, focus on image. Um, I'm going to go through, I, Face in the Crowd is the film installation, as well as at the same time we were shooting the film um, I shot these photographs 
to go along with the body of work. So I'm, I have production photos, behind the scenes photos of that, as well as um, some of the photographs. So I'll just kind of walk, walk you through that. Um, this whole body of work was shot on a sound stage in Hollywood over a period of four days. Um, it was my first time shooting on a sound stage and I chose to shoot there because it allowed me complete freedom to create these kind of manufactured realities. Um, we had 350 extras on set for the crowd series and I would pick and choose for each scene that I was setting up. Um, we had very large lights brought in to act as the sun or gelling them to make them seem like different interiors. And everything about this down to the last freckle really is um, set up and controlled. So we, we had painted on sunburns and mustaches ready to become eyebrows when I wanted them a little bushier and press on nails for the women, false eyelashes. I was looking at Fellini and how he would add um, the white powdered makeup on men and then add a bit of rouge on the tip of the nose and the cheeks to give the kind of alcoholic vibe. And I uh, adopted that for Face in the Crowd. I'm really into characters and the focus on characters. I read about the Wizard of Oz and how they um, set up an assembly line every morning to put the munchkins through hair, makeup, and wardrobe. And I used that as well to kind of efficiently create these characters that we'd been, my crew and I had been um, figuring out the costumes and the wigs and everything for, for all the weeks leading up to this. Um, these scenes that we would put together were um, manufactured to feel very familiar, almost generic and stereotypical. I wanted it to feel a little nostalgic so that there would be space between the viewer and, the, and the, the real world that the viewer presently lives in so that um, maybe they could have that space to view the image better and kind of interact with it in a more personal way. Because I felt like if it was too present, too much based in present time, then maybe it would, it would be viewed differently or there, there, wouldn't, there wouldn't be able to, it allows more freedom and space for the viewer, I think, and the audience. Um, so the timelessness and the stylization is really important to my practice um, to be able to keep that illusion going and then I can work within the framework of that illusion to communicate on any subject. Um, the, the, uh, the three screen installation for the film was a really important aspect to this work because this body of work is a really it's personal to me in that coming from LA where we don't really have crowds, except if you're at a Dodgers game or something. Um, I started traveling more than ever over p the last three or four years and the crowds that I would encounter in New York and London or where, whatever airport I was in, um, I found to be really jarring at times or feel overwhelming and other times, depending on my emotional state of mind, um, I would become really interested in the individuals in the crowd and wonder where they were going that day or what their experiential track was or how it was different than mine. So the film really sh reflects the, t the two uh, sides to the crowd. Um, it starts with the interviews of the individuals. I wanted them to feel like very different characters, um, telling just random stories, anything that came to mind. As, and they were mixed with real stories from the extras or family members or friends that I would, or 
sorry, strangers that I would meet in cafes and I would just ask them to be a part of it. Um, mixed, mixed with stories that I would give them. We had manufactured stories or dialogue that I would write and it was an interesting co contrast. Just, well, there's a lot I can say about it. <laughs> yeah, you told me uh, when we start to discuss about, uh, about your work, you told me about your experience with casting and how you, you brought the casting along and, and eventually how you got the characters that you were looking for. Because I mean, you worked actually with the film industry and you're, you're kind of using also like all these mechanisms or all these inventions, I mean, to start with casting and then you, you were describing the, the sound stage that you used and uh, the, you told, told me about the cameraman that, that you got on board. And so it's really kind of interesting that you almost quote this cinematographic culture, like you use this whole machine of image production and you modulate the content or you, you brush it up to a different state because of course it's not a feature movie, but it's something, something completely different. And uh, it would be interesting to know a little bit more about like how you steer those elements or like those mechanisms without losing control because they, they must have a certain routine in how they do things. And like, did you have to intervene or like how did you steer this whole process? Well, this is my third time making <clears throat> a, sh a short film beyond a minute. So um, I the first short film that I made, it was very intimidating walking onto set the first day and seeing how much larger the production is when you're doing moving images as opposed to still images. Because the first one that I did called Despair was... Um, I was kind of looking at it more as a still image that kind of moved a little to the left and a little to the right to see just a bit more of the story. And each film that I made after kind of expanded that idea until Face in the Crowd, I feel like, is definitely more of a narrative film. And it sits in the, f the film world, um, storytelling. And um, I think the fact that I've been working with the same team of people, the same producer who's a friend of mine from 10 years, and the same hair and makeup people were also my friends first. That I was, I'm not looking for necessarily the most talented people in the film industry. I'm looking for people that I feel comfortable with and I feel like we have an understanding of aesthetic, the same aesthetic, and people that, well, it's really about being comfortable because I'm, Ultimately, it's me sending them specific ideas, and I, I need to kind of oversee it. It's more about kind of overseeing an idea at this point and trusting that each member of the team that we've kind of concocted will um, stand up and bring it <laughs> on the day of. I was quite impressed by your curriculum because you never went to high school. Like, you, you dropped high school because... Uh, yeah, you have to tell it if you want to the public, but I think it was quite interesting. You never went to art school and you developed your you work really fast. I, I also thought it was interesting when you told me that you were doing black and white images for six months or so and that once you exhibited them and people were asking you, but what is with this specific figure? Like uh, they asked about incidents before or after or like the afterlife of certain protagonists that you have taking photos from. And uh, eventually you developed it into, into this very elaborated and ambitious filming installation. So like, how did that hunger grow to, to work as an individual artist, as a self-taught individual artist into a complex organization and an image production that is very elaborated, that is very colorful and complex? Um, if I'm honest, it probably has more to do with being a little bit naive on the business side of things. It's not really, I probably think about the logistics of coming up with the idea much later than, um, than deciding that I'm going to do, do an idea, produce an idea. So it's, it's always just been a focus on 
having a concept, feeling very connected to it personally, so kind of trusting that it um, that it's important to me enough to go through all of the um, madness that that you have to go through in order to to see it to fruition. And also, I think growing up around Hollywood, where um, just constantly seeing sets going up and coming down and these huge teams of people producing these these worlds and um, sometimes walking into a restaurant and sitting down waiting for the waitress to come over and then being tapped on the shoulder by a PA that that day they're, they're using it as a set and it's not a real restaurant. I think just ha having that reality constantly when I was growing up um, made me feel like it wasn't impossible to to create what was inside my head. Thank you very much, Alex. So I think we have to, to speed up the this place place discussion, but obviously all of you are living on the North American continent and since many years we are part of a globalized world, especially the exchange between the United States and Europe is is amazing. I mean, I know that, for example, this art magazine Parquet has been found that one of the goals was to open up the, the pipeline between the United States and Europe, which is a, a natural state of affairs nowadays. But still, I mean, when I, when I see your work and when I hear you talk, I, I have the notion that still you, you reflect American reality to a certain degree and that, uh, that your work would change to a certain extent if you would pick your home base being in Switzerland or being in Europe or being elsewhere. And I don't know, Sam, like you, you haven't lived, you haven't spent all your life in California, but obviously it opens up perspectives, ideas, inspirations. Could you also live in New York, for example? Um. Well, yeah, like I moved from New York to LA to make a lot of this, <laughs> uh, a lot of the work that is out um, in the sunlight because I couldn't have sunlight year round in New York, so it was a geographical necessity. And then I started making these rain paintings like a year ago, and uh, and now I'm spending time in upstate New York. So we've moved back for half the year to New York, not to the city. And so I've ended up working outdoors as well a lot more, and that's largely via being in LA where it's possible and um, getting used to that and then migrating back to New York. But it being upstate New York is very different than working in New York City, of course. But I think moving outside of the studio, and I, and I think like it, it is interesting to me presently about being an American artist, but not, like I don't feel like a New York artist or an LA artist, but you know, I am definitely an American artist, but maybe that sense of globalized art production can happen more slowly, but is happening. Like, I just made some work in Finland mm. on a residency. Mm. <laughs> but it was very much the same, and, and on a conceptual level, at least for me, it's easy to translate it to different places, and that's actually what has become very interesting by working and having the place be a part of the work. Thank you. Gavin, a question uh, to, to the place of the exhibition. I mean, it's a bit a special exhibition. Unlimited is a very specific format. It's a museum-like setting. On the other hand, it's a commercial presentation where sales happen. And uh, I put your work in the same space as Richard Long. And uh, I think both of you are working with constellation of, of objects placed on the floor, although Richard Long's is, is far more flat than yours. And, and you pile it up, but like how, how much does it make a difference like to be in the context of an exhibition as a specific type of place? Often it makes a, a greater difference than it does here, I think. This to me feels like a, like a space, like a place that gives enough space to each work that it that it can stay there by itself. It, it feels less like a whole show than, than it does a presentation of all of these different individual works. So actually the eccentricity of your work is, is well protected. 
in the context of unlimited and it can unfold itself without really being, for example, um, put under the umbrella of a subject or of a group show and so on. Yeah, it's very nice to have it here, I have to say. <laughs> but yeah, I, that's I, a do, nice I, I do like I do like that you put the the long over in the the same section. I uh, I mean, it's very there, there different. A, Obviously, formally, it has like some yes. some parallels, but it's very different. I think the difference is uh, is actually interesting that you can compare the two works. We can also show like how it is possible. And I think that's a really interesting part of Unlimited being a transgenerational show that you have like all these echoes. You have uh, different subjects that are coming back, that are reworked, that are reimagined. And I think it's very nice to see those dialogues and those back and forth between generations. Nick, I mean, you create a place, you, you use a domestic setting in your work, and it's not easy to create the illusion of, of a domestic interior in a hall where the ceiling height is actually 33 feet or 11 meters. Do, do you, how would you describe like the moment, maybe the decisive moment of a spectator entering your work, like let's think of an ideal visitor, you know, who approaches your work the right way. And when, when would you see like that moment where, where it starts to twist and where he enters like the fourth dimension of, of the reality of art, of an artwork where it kind of pops up into a different state of reality? I don't, I don't know that I can say, you know, if there is a decisive moment or I would hope that somehow in its looping as this as this particular piece is going you know i'm i'm surprised as i see it how how people respond to it and what kinds of things happen um, so that was for me the one of the most interesting things about realizing realizing the piece here because i've never you know exhibited in a context like this before um, but it does seem to me that that the work creates a kind of more intimate space within within this vast, high-ceilinged, you know, convention hall, and uh, and people have said that to me. I mean, I I made some decisions also instead of taking out all the lights so that the thing is sort of illuminated by itself and then also cast into shadow. Um, but yeah, somehow the the ideal visitor sort of always ends up being something totally different than I expect. Thank you. And Alex, maybe to come back to the remark of this lady who told me your exhibition space is much too small. What is your answer to that lady? Well, I, I wanted it to feel the way that you might feel in a crowd or the way, ways that I've felt in crowds where you kind of miss things on either side of you. So having the three screens um, in a very intimate way I wanted people to feel a slight anxiety about what they might be missing um, and feel very immersed in the moment. I've actually been experimenting a little with um, bringing, bringing the characters from the film. I brought them to the opening that I had in Los Angeles where we dressed up the characters. I brought everyone back and had them um, interact with the crowd, with the, with the real crowd at the opening. And so when people would get up from seeing the film after being so immersed in it, um, they would walk out and come into the light and realize maybe that the person next to them had just basically come out of the screen and is now beside them. So I think it's, it just adds a surreal element as well as kind of unsettling, I think. Maybe freaked a few people out. <laughs> Thank you. I hope that uh, that the masses of people in Basel, at least without costume and makeup, can give back with a with a maybe a, a certain presence that that could also turn into into too much and in the very specific presence. But thank you so much. Uh, thanks for your interest. Thanks for coming. So Sam Falls, Gavin Canyon, Nick Mouse, Alex Prager. Uh, I think we're done. I think we did a little bit too long, so there are no questions. Sorry for that. Thanks, Jeremy.